Two weeks ago, Parkland, Florida, a massacre where the public is concerned, uh, 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 all the activity and protesting about gun laws, but there are problems in the uh, institutions. The reporting of the uh, of the crime levels has been cut uh, because of uh, uh, interest to not show uh, crime to minorities and uh, failures in the FBI and the, the, the police uh, following through. Phil Haney, you've been in the swamp. What happened during the Obama administration to our uh, processes for uh, security and, uh, and in investigation uh, FBI, DHS, what has happened? Well, you might call it a saturation or a breakdown. And as you said, I did witness it firsthand being an armed federal law enforcement officer and with a duty assignment of counterterrorism, how political ideology came in and saturated into the law enforcement arena and literally made it impossible for us to do our job. So what does that have to do with school security? It's really all sort of part of the same worldview. The failure to recognize, to have the wherewithal to secure our national border and whatever combination of things that needs is reflected right through the levels of our society into, in this case, a school. Whereas there was no real basic security going in, going out, no ID, no scanners, nothing. So the person just walked straight in. Now in Israel, for example, everywhere you go in public, there are very obvious presence of security, both concealed but also right out in the open. It's a natural part of the life it enhances the security. So that's one of the breakdowns. The other one is failure to follow basic law enforcement protocol under a, uh, a shooting incident. It's not to stand outside and wait to decide what to do because in these cases they're only moments, seconds, minutes at most. And by the time the these guys made up their mind, it was already too late. That's the second one. Local law enforcement response. The third failure was the FBI, which initially, we recall in the press conferences, they vigorously defended the actions that were taken, that they had done all that they could do, which is what we hear virtually every time. And then we discovered they had not done all that they could do, they didn't even try what we call first level investigation to find out the author of the YouTube. And then we found that at least two other citizens had called in and reported that his behavior was frightening them, that he seemed on the verge of doing something bad. And then we found out that they never followed up with it. So now you have the three things, the actual physical security of the school, the local law enforcement failure to respond, the federal law enforcement failure, and then another one is social services and or a different branch of law enforcement, now we're up to four, who went to his house, how many times was it? 29, I mean, how many times should it take, 50? The point is, is that there were numerous opportunities to intervene and let's just say in a nice way help this kid so that's four major areas of breach right there before we even get to how he actually did the shooting or what gun that he used and if we don't address those other breakdowns then banning a certain kind of gun is just really putting a band-aid on a you know on cancer we have to step back, evaluate our definition of what security is, both domestic and even international. People have thought that with the Trump administration, 
the inhibitions of the Obama administration that he would be draining the swamp and that we would now have a new era of openness and aggressiveness towards uh, terrorism, uh, confronting jihadism, uh, the issues of uh, uh, gun uh, suppression. Now suddenly, here we are, uh, uh, just into the after the first year of the Trump administration, are there still inhibitions within the system of uh, both on a federal and and maybe uh, decentralized level? Well, this is what you call in law enforcement discovery. I'm not sure if any of us, at least many of us, really comprehended how broad and deep and wide the swamp really was, including. President Trump himself, who will say, I am not a politician. He didn't come into the office as a seasoned veteran politician. He came in as a businessman. And so I doubt that he really realized how saturated, infused with this ideology, the social, the political, and the law enforcement arenas of our country actually are. With progressive leftist ideology and or though this attack doesn't seem to be related, nonetheless, the threat of terror from the global Islamic ideology. The failure to address those is just a symptom of a, a greater, I'll call it a blind spot in our national vision. And if you drive around on the interstate with a blind spot in your mirror and you insist that you're not going to recognize that that blind spot is there, what's the inevitable result going to be? You're going to crash into somebody or somebody's going to crash into you and then will you be able to say you didn't know? So fix the blind spot first. That's going to decrease your chances of getting in an accident significantly. Will it prevent you from ever getting in another accident again? No. But at least it's something that you can address and take responsibility for. Fix the blind spot of at least the four. And there's a fifth one. And that is, as we've discussed, the mental health structure. How do we intervene? How do we help people that are what we call cries for help? And uh, do that in a way that brings that person as much as possible into a, into a more healthy state of mind because it's endangering others. It's not just about that one individual and his rights. It's also whether or not that behavior might eventually lead, like what we saw, unfortunately, to the attack at the school. So I've talked about five major areas that need to be addressed and banning any gun or all guns isn't really going to produce the, uh, the results that some of the people in the media class or the political class keep insisting will solve the problem. It won't. The deep state which existed under the Obama administration, how prevalent is it in persisting now into the second year of the Trump term? Well, the thing about draining the swamp, a.k.a. the environment of the deep state, is that I don't, I'm not sure in people's minds what they really thought, what they envision when they talk about draining the swamp. But you have to remember that just because you take all the water out of the swamp, the creatures that lived in it are still there. And I have discovered something about those strange mutant hybrid creatures that live in the swamp. They're amphibious. They can walk right out of the water and stand right next to you. And in many cases, those strange creatures from the swamp have no faces. And I discovered that during my time in government when the very same individuals who we hear about in the, in the FISA scandal and in the unmasking in the previous administration were the very same people that were going after me, investigating me, but I didn't have the benefit of a Twitter campaign or social media or any protection clear up to and including the president. I took it straight and sober and fortunately survived it. But 
seeing these people operate before it broke out into what I call the global big screen media level in Technicolor. So it's not theoretical for me because when I asked them when they were investigating me when I was still active duty, why are you looking at my emails? Why are you looking at my phone calls for years, not months, but years before the dates of the events that they were investigating me for? And would you like to know their answer? We can do whatever we want. That In other words, without explanation. Without explanation. We can do whatever we want. And we're going to prove it. We're going to investigate you simply for t upholding your oath and doing your job because we don't like your political worldview. We don't like your approach to law enforcement. You're targeting these individuals who are part of the trademark religion of peace. This administration has formed alliances with them and you're contradicting our narrative, our, our policy, so we're going to come after you. And no amount of documentation or evidence, no matter how high up you stacked it, was enough to persuade them to take that information into account, i.e. connecting the dots. And so they made a choice to either ignore or remove the information, which is what they did, or to actually act on the information, which is not what they did. And that brings us right back to the example of the FBI. When people saw something, they said something, they called in, and the FBI didn't respond at all. Now imagine if, if the FBI not only failed to respond to those calls, but actually erased the information, deleted it, out of the electronic system. That would be way worse, right? Well, that's exactly what happened during my time as active duty. They didn't just ignore it or fail to respond to it. They took it a whole another moral step deeper. Because when you erase information, that's obviously a conscious, deliberate, and intentional action, right? And then the third step that they took was go after the person who put the information in the system in the first place. So there's three levels of response. That's the swamp. Ignore it, create a false narrative, but somehow deflect from the obvious. Remove it, say that it never happened in the first place, or go after the person who actually was working on the case or had put that information into the system and discredit him without ever really addressing the validity or the, the accuracy of the information that they removed. Sure. So that's how it works, three-step process. That's the swamp and that's how they operate. And we're seeing now evidence of these. It is a top-down thing. It filters its way through. And now we're seeing that that saturation process, if you want to call it that, the consequences of it. So I hope that if we're going to solve shootings like Parkland, that we don't just put the emphasis on the wrong syllable over and over again, but that we address those other five, at least five, breakdowns in our national security. The primary responsibility of the federal government is to prevent outbreaks of domestic violence in each state. That's true. That, mean, that, that is the fundamental. That and to prevent invasion from foreign power. Invasion of our border on a macro sense and then at the state level to prevent, and it literally says this, outbreaks of domestic violence. Those responsibilities were not and have not been fulfilled in these series of attacks that we've seen in the last 5, 10, 15 years. There is a meme of the notion that, uh, that the Bush administration was, ex was uh, letting a jihad uh, attack occur in order to get revenge 
on the uh, the assassination or targeting of by Saddam Hussein of of, of, of uh, 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 George Bush's father, George W. Bush. There's a there's this notion that that the administration let it happen so that they could respond, they could go in into Iraq. What I'm uh, the, the parallel I'm asking you about is, do you believe that there is a complicity to allow these massacres to occur in order to address the issue of gun laws and divide the country based on that level? It wouldn't just be gun laws, though. The Boston Marathon bombing had, didn't had involve guns at all. And yet we discovered after the fact that these individuals were on the law enforcement radar. Not just FBI, but on DHS's radar too. And in the subsequent post-event analysis, of course, what did they do? They exonerated themselves from any responsibility. Everybody did all that they could do, they said. And then we go, for example, to San Bernardino, which did involve guns. But then we found out that Syed Farouk, the shooter, and his, uh, his associate, Enrique Marquez, who had supplied him the guns, were also on the FBI radar and had been tracked for some time. Enrique Marquez, to this day, is in jail for multiple failed terrorist plots. Well, how do they know there were multiple failed plots? So it do, and the bombs and the components that were in the apartments that nobody knew about, except that we found out that neighbors were suspicious, but they were afraid to say anything because they didn't want to be branded as an Islamophobe. And then we go to Garland, Texas, where it turns out there was an FBI agent, literally, in the car behind the two shooters who backed up and tried to escape and was apprehended by local law enforcement, he's lucky he didn't get himself killed. He was an FBI agent undercover, sitting right behind them at the checkpoint, security checkpoint, by the way, in Garland, Texas. Same thing with Orlando. FBI knew about Omar Mateen and the mosque that he attended, where two other terrorists had attended. One went to Syria and blew himself up in a truck. The other one was arrested on weapons charges and, and money. So those are just three that I can think of right off the bat. So are they doing it for some deep reason? I can't tell you exactly what the deep reason would be, but I can tell you that the breakdown in basic law enforcement started really becoming obvious around 2006. That was three years after the Department of Homeland Security was founded in order to protect America from subsequent 9-11 attacks and that I actually saw it emerge up out of the ground about that time. And then it just that's why I use the word saturation. It's like a sponge floating in the water. Eventually, that sponge is going to become super saturated. It's just going to float there, bobbing along the top of the water. And that's kind of what we're seeing is this saturation of ideology that in a sense has blinded law enforcement, reduced significantly their ability to recognize the nature of the threat that is standing almost literally right in front of them. For example, in 212, the FBI's guidelines specifically said that even though an individual is part of a known terrorist organization, that you can't automatically assume that he himself is a terrorist. So that disconnect, you can see. How will you ever take cases forward to the arrest level, to probable cause, if you're not even allowed to make the connection that this guy who is affiliated, well, let's just say with Hamas, actually really isn't a terrorist himself. He just likes to hang out with the Hamas guys. Not likely. Because they're like any organization. You don't just walk in and decide you want to become part of this intricately structured organization. You have to be 
brought in and trained and vetted and you become part of that structure it's not a casual thing so nobody is affiliated with a terrorist organization casually but that is what FBI was taught and then a couple years later Secretary of State or Homeland Security Jay Johnson signed a unilateral law enforcement discretion directive saying that people that were known affiliates of terrorist groups as long as it was only limited that was the word could still get visas to come into the United States that by the way has not been corrected so what we're really doing is highlighting examples, specific examples, that could be corrected, should be. Otherwise, inevitably, we're going to see the same kind of attacks. And until the day comes when we have the courage and the fortitude to start addressing these major breakdowns, we'll keep having these kind of attacks, either domestic violence or terrorism regardless of what kind of gun they might happen to use. By the way, something like 90 plus percent of all gun crimes, violent, are with pistols, not with rifles. So banning a, a, a semi-automatic, percentage-wise, yeah, each person is not a percentage point. Every person's life is important. But overall, big picture, it's not going to hardly make a dent in the overall use of guns, pistols, in crime. So, I can ask you one question in closing. During the Democrat administration, people were concerned to speak out, not only that they might lose their jobs, but people were concerned that they might get knocked off, like Seth Rich, for instance. But you spoke out like uh, Seth Rich is alleged to have done in, in leaking um, uh, certain information, you spoke out. How do you feel now under the, the Republican administration? Is that, is that now off the table? Can people still speak freely? Well, to begin with, to answer your question, how do I feel? I feel more hopeful than I have in a long time. Is everything fixed and perfect? No. But it's kind of like one line going down and one line going up. Things are gradually getting better while they would have gotten worse. So every day and week, that gap gets bigger and bigger. It's not... So, um, what will happen if people speak up? One of the things that's important to point out is that I never violated the chain of command. I'm not a Snowden or a Bradley Manning or a WikiLeaker. And that's probably what helped me survive it, is the fact that I've always stayed within the chain of command. And my ultimate final stopping point in the chain of command, after I went through every level within my own agency, from direct supervisor right on up through the headquarters in Washington, was Congress. And one of the biggest criticism of Edward Snowden is that he didn't take his concerns to Congress. Now, would that have been easy? Is there like a nice little road map in a room you go to, room 247, and you fill out a few forms, and they say, thank you for coming in, Mr. Haney. We'll get right back to you. We'll assign you a lawyer, and we'll, we'll address this outrage right away. No. Being a whistleblower is a perilous occupation. There are numerous obstacles along the way, which can pop up at any time. Some of them are visible, but most of them are not. It's like a place full of landmines and porcupines. You might get poked or step on a landmine at any given time. Nonetheless, as my case shows, despite the fact that it was inordinately difficult, I never violated the chain of command. And now the information is in the hands of Congress. The story's been told. And now we're seeing it basically proven every day. And so I am still waiting for a remedy, a fix. I'm willing to help if anybody ever asks me. But uh, the information is now with Congress and it will, remains to be seen whether they'll have the uh, wherewithal to actually 
look into it. But nonetheless, from a personal point of integrity, I did what was the right thing. I can't control what people in the hierarchy of authority do or don't do, but I can am responsible for what I do myself. And you go back to the cop that was on the ground at Parkland. That was a moment when he had to make a personal decision about why he's even a policeman at all. And he chose to withdraw, to not go in. For people to familiarize themselves with your story, your book is entitled... It's called See Something, Say Nothing. Written by... Myself, and I have a co-writer, Art Moore. Basically, I'd never written a book for public before, so he helped me. He framed the house, and I put the wallpaper and the carpeting and the furniture in it. He would give me the basic outline, and I would fill in all the details. So I wrote it. He just helped me kind of get oriented in the right direction. So it's by Philip Haney and Art Moore. It's on Amazon. See Something, Say Nothing is the name of it. Do you publish articles or a blog? I don't have a blog, but you can query me. I have many, many hundreds of either media, radio, TV, and or articles, print articles that cite me or that I have written as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Haney, for speaking and sharing your insights. We appreciate it. You're very welcome.